Hey everyone and welcome back to Just Finish Coding. I'm Sri Ram and this video is part 2 of the Connect 4 tutorial series. If you haven't watched part 1, then click on the card up here. And just a reminder, if you are stuck during any part, then you can head over to the downloadable files link in the description, download just the part that you want and then continue. By the end of this video, you will have the main part of the Connect 4 game mechanism completely ready. In fact, you would be pretty much able to play the game as if it was over, but the game will not end if either player has won. Let's get started. At the end of the last video, we just disabled movement after test move. After this, there are a series of steps that must be done extremely quickly. So let us create a custom block called move, making sure to run without screen refresh. Next, create three more blocks. The first is called step one, the second called step two, and the third called step three. Throw them all in the move definition one after another. Each time before the coin animates and falls downward, we have to perform three different steps. Step one will involve getting all the vacant tiles in the current column. In this example, it will involve getting the indices of the following tiles. Step two will involve finding out which is the available tile at the bottom. In this case, it would be the tile with an X value of six. Finally, step three will involve replacing the exact items in the list and ensuring that the coin actually animates and drops into the tile. Back into Scratch, create a list called possible row values and delete everything in the list. Now create another variable called C for this sprite only. This will be used as a counter. Set C to one and then repeat length of board coordinates. Each time, check if letter three of item C of board coordinates is equal to the column position. And if yes, check if that item in the board is vacant. If both of these conditions are met, then we add that particular item to possible row values. Finally, change C by one in order to loop through the entire list. All this should make intuitive sense. First, we are ensuring that we are filtering out incorrect columns. Then we are filtering out occupied tiles. Remember that the format of items in board coordinates is X comma Y. So in order to get the correct column position, we have to look not at the entire value, but just the third letter of that value. On to step two. First, create a variable for this sprite only called largest value and then set it to zero. Set C to one, then loop through the possible row values list. Each time, check if letter one of that item is greater than largest value and if it is, set largest value to that number. Now, create another variable for this sprite only called current move. Set this to item, item number of, item C in possible row values, in board coordinates, of board coordinates. This is actually slightly roundabout and I programmed this initially this way for a different purpose and you will get the same result if you just set it to item C of possible row values. Anyway, it shouldn't be too hard to understand this. First, we are finding the index in board coordinates where the particular item is situated and then we are using it. Of course, at the end, increment C by one. One thing to notice here is the behavior of the largest value variable. If there is a possible tile that exists, then the variable becomes that tile's X value. If there are not any tiles, then it remains zero. So in step three, check if largest value is zero. And if it is, then set move on back to yes. Since the move made was an illegal one, we can enable movement at the top once again. Otherwise, replace item, 
item number of current move in board coordinates of board with turn. Like the previous one, this may look confusing at first, but really it is quite simple. We are just replacing the corresponding item in board in order to let ourselves know that the tile is no longer vacant. Next, create a variable called end row for all sprites. End row would just be letter 1 of current move. To signal the animation to begin, broadcast move coin. In the coin sprite, when move coin is received, check if clone is no and if turn is red. If yes, then glide 0.4 seconds to x, x position, and y, 74 minus 41.6 multiplied by end row minus 1. This may seem very confusing and it certainly deserves an explanation. Here's our objective. We know the row number that the coin must glide to. That is simply the end row variable, but we do not know the y position. A simple script would be to just change the y position downwards by end row times the tile width, in this case 41.6. But there is a problem with this, and that is the coin is initially offset upwards by a value slightly higher than the tile width. Thus, our method actually ends up backfiring pretty badly. What we do instead is to figure out the y coordinate of the first row. This is 74, and then move downward to our required row. But there is a small catch. 74 is the y coordinate of the first row, not the zeroth row. So rather than going downward by 41.6 multiplied by end row, we are going to move downward by 41.6 multiplied by end row minus one. Getting back to scratch, if you test this program, then the animation mechanism should work as intended, but it doesn't look that good. The falling down is fine, but once the coin is in place, we would like to move it to the front. This can be achieved with clones. Back to the code. Next, create a clone and then broadcast a new message called change turn. When a clone is created, we set the clone variable to yes and then go to the front layer. At this point, you should realize the ramifications of the clone variable. Whenever the arrow keys are pressed, we would want only the sprite at the top of the screen to move. Indeed, we would like the clones to remain completely stationary. The clone variable allows us to do exactly this. Now, for some simplicity in the control sprite, all we have to do here is change the turn. So when change turn is received, check if turn is red. And if yes, then set it to green. And otherwise, if it is green, set it to red. Since movement is disabled at the moment, enable it by setting move on to yes. Now it is time to split the coin sprite into two. If you head over to its costumes, you will notice two costumes, a red one and a green one. Duplicate the sprite into two and then rename them green coin and red coin. In the red coin, remove the green costume, and in the green coin, remove the red costume. A few more changes in the green coin. At the beginning, hide it instead of showing. Every place where turn is red, we will have to change it to green. This is the case with the left arrow, the right arrow, during move coin, the space key, and the main script. And that is everything for this video. Try testing the program now. Wow, it really looks like we are getting a complete game. Both the players can play and the turns switch automatically and the coins drop where they are supposed to. Isn't that wonderful? If you've enjoyed this video, then make sure you leave a like and also don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thanks for watching and I will see you in part three.